Good morning again. Thanks for joining. Good to see you. Um, I know you missed me a lot last week. Ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a lot better. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for praying as well. Wait, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we love you in this place. We look to you. We honor you. We worship you, Father. You are good. Your love endures forever. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you for your faithfulness that sustains us, Lord. Father, even as we learn from your word once again, Holy Spirit, we lean on your understanding, not on our wisdom, not on, not on our own intellectual understanding, but we lean on your understanding. So we prepare our hearts for you to speak to us. And when you speak, uh, help us to be sensitive to your voice, to discern your voice, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. OK, let me share the screen for us. Okay, um, so we want I want to go into what chapter are we? Chapter eight or nine or something? Nine, right? Okay. Uh, we learn a little bit about moving prophetically in worship in this chapter. Uh, we'll see how far we can go. Um, yeah. So how are we going to learn? Uh, what are we going to do? Is we'll try and understand first what the connection between music and worship. Uh, everything is there. You can all see on the back. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm blocking the view. Um, so what does the Bible have to say about music and worship? Uh, the connection between the, um, worship and the prophetic, right? And where all these three things meet, music, worship, and the prophetic, which place it meets the, for the first time. And uh, we'll not go too deep into the prophetic, because you will do a separate course on just understanding the prophetic separately. And uh, we learn a little bit about the prophetic song. Is that OK? Yeah? Um, OK. Um, so we learned about the seven Hebrew words for praise. And out of the seven, one of the words is zamar. Isn't it? And zamar means that's. It's what it actually means about playing an instrument, or literally means plucking the strings, like we play the guitar. Okay, to touch the strings, to make melody and music. Um, so here we see the connection between music and worship, right? And one of the Hebrew words is zamar. In Psalm 149, verse 3, we say that let them put his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. OK. Uh, all right. Did I hear something? All right. Hey, thanks. Some more scripture on music and worship is Psalm 150, verse 3 to 5. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him. By the way, all these are in your notes. I'm just projecting it, okay? Uh, praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instrument, flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Um, so all of this, you, you see this, it's, it's used praise with this instrument. Praise with this instrument. Okay, you see the connection between music. Instrument is always related to music, isn't it? Yes or no? Right. So you see the connection between music and worship. Okay. Yeah. Praise also is fine. Now let's. We now that we've understood the connection between music and worship, we'll uh, understand the connection between the music and the prophetic. Okay, where are a few times that uh, where these two meet together? In First Samuel chapter ten, verse five, we read that 
after that you shall come to the hill of god where the philistine garrison is now who said this who saying this to whom you know that question in school days exams and all no who said to whom so first samuel chapter 10 verse 5 who is saying to whom roshan is saying to you samuel is saying to saul right prophet samuel has just anointed king saul right so that's the context so prophet samuel is telling to saul he's saying after that you shall come to the hill of god where the philistine garrison is and it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets what do prophets do they prophesy isn't it yes or no yeah so coming down the high place with a stringed instrument a tambourine a flute and a harp before them and they will be prophesying so here we see the connection between the music and the prophetic now samuel prophet samuel is prophesying about these people who will be prophetic did you understand that prophet samuel is prophesying about a group of people who will be prophesying and look at the detail that prophet samuel is getting into there will be a group of people he is even telling what which instrument they will be playing right it's pretty intense so he's saying that this group of people will be prophesying by playing the instrument so there's a connection between music and the prophetic okay um one more example about music and the prophetic is uh, from this chapter second kings chapter 3 verse 14 to 16 excuse me <coughs> it says and elisha said as the lord of hosts lives before whom i stand surely we are not that i regard the presence of jehoshaphat king of judah i would not look at you nor see you but now bring me a musician and then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the lord came upon elisha and then he said thus says the lord make this valley so and so okay um, now if you read the context if you should read the whole chapter chapter 3 even chapter 2 and chapter 4 after this this is a very important uh chapter because a lot of it is depending on elisha he has to make a certain decision if he doesn't make a certain decision a lot of people are going to die that is the situation they are in and so for him to hear from the lord elisha is saying bring me a musician now a quick question do we have to play music for god to say something to you what is prophetic God speaking to to us through us isn't it so simple question for us to be prophetic do you need music all the time no pastor yay thank you no right god can speak without music god can speak without playing the pads no sometimes we need the pads it's like oh anointing <laughs> isn't it uh, nothing wrong with the pads i i like pads i know a lot of people who like pads because it creates some sort of atmosphere uh, these are examples of few situations circumstances where god chose to move or speak through music when music was being played but we do not limit the prophetic we do not limit god saying that okay god will speak only when someone plays a g chord or a c major whichever your, your favorite chord is are you with me okay so this is a couple of examples uh, first we saw music and worship and then music and the prophetic and you can get more of this information from uh, APC publication called Understanding the Prophetic um, by Pastor Ashish Raichur. 
Now, we see all these three elements meet together for the first time in the Bible in the tabernacle of David. What are the three things? What are the three things that we just looked at? Music, worship, and prophetic. Everybody say music, worship, and prophetic. So for the first time in the Bible, we see these three elements meeting together. And that place where they meet together is the tabernacle of David. OK, the tabernacle of David. Now, um, without going through too many scriptures, uh, or the details, I've mentioned all those uh, scriptures. I want you to go through it. Now, when we were studying the chapter on the presence of God, uh, we started talking about it from Genesis 3, isn't it? Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they hid themselves. Yeah? And that was the beginning of separation. That's what sin does. It separates us from the presence of God. So from Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 25, what's the time gap? I spoke about it. I taught you. From Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus 25, what is the time gap? Sorry? Yeah, 2,500 years. Thank you. Right. So for 2,500 years, there was no dwelling place or resting place for God's presence, isn't it? And until Moses, God chooses Moses and he says, build a tabernacle, a sanctuary, there I will meet with you. Okay, this is in the book of Revelation. Which book? Exodus. Exodus. Okay, talk to me, guys. All right. So from the books of what's what's the next book after Exodus? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Okay. So we come to the book of Joshua. We see the people of Israel have stepped into the promised land. Joshua has led them into victory. Okay. Um, how many battles did they win or fight? And won? I will call it students. Okay, so when you read through the book of Joshua, they fought almost 30, 31 battles. Okay, now why am I saying all of this? They had the tabernacle of Moses. In the book of Joshua, you don't read a lot about it. And then when, by the time you come to the book of Judges, they have settled in nicely in the land of flowing with milk and honey. Uh, they have compromised a lifestyle of worship and holiness with the lifestyle of Canaanites. They've begun to build altars of Baal. Uh, you know, that's all of a false worship. The gods that the Canaanites worshipped, Israelites began to worship them. So all of a sudden, there is no scene of where the tabernacle of Moses is. It's like they've lost the sight of the place of worship. They've gone back to building altars, false altars of worship. And so in the book of Judges, that's what it is. And then we go into First Samuel, the book of First Samuel. Right, we uh, <clears throat> in First Samuel chapter four. It's, and I, I want to encourage each and every one of you to read that chapter. It's one of the most uh, devastating chapters in the history of Israel. So what happens? Long story short, still there's no news of the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, we only know that Ark of the Covenant was kept in a place called Shiloh. Everybody say Shiloh. Okay, so. It, we only know that until then, we until First Samuel chapter four, we don't really know where even the Ark of the Covenant is. And so, in First Samuel chapter four, we see okay, there was a high priest called uh, Eli, right? And this Eli was very old; he was fat, and he couldn't move. He was the high priest of the temple. Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. These two sons were very bad. They were supposed to be priests of the temple, but they, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and 4 when you read, they committed 
sin in the eyes of the Lord. That means they committed sexual immorality. They slept with the women who came to the temple. They were very sinful in all their ways. Okay, who am I talking about? The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. Say Hophni and Phinehas. Okay. Jasantha? Do you need something? Okay. Sorry, there was a visitor. <laughs> Are you all with me? Who was the high priest? Eli, right? Now, Eli was very old. He was fat. He did not, he could not see. And he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. I'm fa paraphrasing chapter 4, 1 Samuel chapter 4, okay? Now, what happened? Philistines began to attack Israel. Okay? They began to attack Israel. Now, Israel didn't know what to do. And so what they said, they read the history books. It's like, oh, history. In the history book, it says, before... When they carried the Ark of the Covenant and went into the battle, they won the battle. And so they thought, okay, let us go get the Ark of the Covenant from a place called Shiloh, and then we'll go into the battle, and we'll win the battle against the Philistines. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant, and everybody starts shouting, celebrating, They're like, yay, Ark of the Covenant is here, Israelites, we are going to win against the Philistines. And Philistines hear this, it's like, what is this screaming and, and shouting? Seems like the Ark of the Covenant is in their midst. Surely we are doomed. But what happened? They go into battle. Israel lose miserably. 30,000 men are killed. 30,000 people of Israel, men, are killed in that battle. They lost terribly. 30,000. It's not a small number. And so, okay, 30,000 people are killed. And then what happens is the Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant and go into, the, into their territory, into their land. They've taken away. And so there's one messenger who comes running and he says, Eli, your two sons are died. They died in the battle. And then he says another news. The Philistines have taken away the Ark of the Covenant. And when Eli heard that news, it says Eli fell off the throne. He broke his neck and he died. And one of the wives of the sons of Eli, when she heard that her husband had died, she was pregnant, she goes into labor, and she names her son Ichabod. You know what Ichabod means? Glory has departed. Everything what I've just said is in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Okay? Ichabod. That means the glory has departed. Two sons of Eli thought that they could win the battle without any relationship with God. They thought, okay, this is the secret formula. We'll just do this. What they did, we will do it. We will win. Without intimacy with God, without no relationship with God, they thought they could win the battle. But they lost miserably. Ichabod, the glory had departed. Now, where are we? In 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now, remember, Saul is not anointed yet as a king. Much later, we see that, okay, what happens? Fast forward, Saul is anointed as a king, as the first king of Israel. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. Ark of the Covenant is not there. Let's fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Can we go to 2 Samuel chapter 6, please? So 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. What does it say? The 
David took how many? 30,000 men. Huh. So from 1 Samuel chapter 4, when the Ark of the Covenant was taken, to 2 Samuel chapter 6, that is approximately the time gap again is 70 odd years. How many years? Okay, all of these are very important for you to remember. Because for 70 years, there was not a single person who felt the need to go after the presence of God. King Saul, he became the first king of Israel. He didn't feel the need to go after the Ark of the Covenant to bring it back. Finally, a person called David. So David is first anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 16, I think, yeah, because chapter 17 is about David and Goliath. So David, Saul, uh, Samuel anoints David as a king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. But then he goes through a wilderness period for 14 years. And so until 2 Samuel chapter 6, David finally decides to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. Again, David must have gone to the history books and said, on the day the Ark of the Covenant was taken, 30,000 men were killed. So I am going to take the same number of men and go to bring the presence of God back. Are you with me? This is a little bit of a history lesson, but it's a very important history lesson. Okay? So 70 years so until 2 Samuel chapter 6, the gap between 1 Samuel 4 and 2 Samuel 6. And so he comes and sets up the tabernacle. Um, you'll read more about it there. Um, so Moses' tabernacle had a veil. David's tabernacle had no veil. Right? There was no curtain. There was no outer courts, inner courts, nothing. It was just open for everyone. Right? Now, why is David so significant is David, although he lived in the old covenant, he lived as though he was living in the new covenant. Did you follow? Should I say that again? Although David was living in the old covenant, he lived from the perspective of the new covenant. What is the new covenant? There is no veil. The presence of God is available to all of us, isn't it? We don't have to go through, enter the gates, wash our hands, all of that. Okay, so this is the tabernacle. Let's go a little bit more about the David's tabernacle. You'll read more about it in detail in First Chronicles 25. And we'll learn more about it in detail in your third year course on worship ministry. Okay. Until then, if you're here, First Chronicles chapter 25. Okay. So you in, in that chapter, you will see all these uh, details. In David's tabernacle, they were, he set up about 288 singers. And 4,000 musicians. How many? Yeah. That's a lot of musicians. And there's more. He said about 4,000 gatekeepers. If you can fathom that, you teach me how to understand it because it's just amazing. And he is the, David was the first person to set up this 24 7 worship. So for 24 hours, for seven days, you, do you know for how many years it went on? 33 years. The David's Tabernacle with worship day and night, 24 hours for seven days, it went on for 33 years. Same duration as Jesus' life. Okay, they would write songs. Uh... So, First Chronicles chapter twenty-five, verse one, it says, "David and the commanders of the army set aside the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jeritan for the ministry of prophesying." And that's what it will say. <laughs> First Chronicles twenty-five, verse one, is that what it says? Am I right? David. 
and the commanders with the commanders of the army set apart sons of Asaph, sons of Heman, and sons of Jeruthun for the ministry of prophesying. It's interesting, isn't it? So again, this is just to re-emphasize the point that it is in the tabernacle of David where worship, music, and prophetic meet. These three elements meet together in his place. Right? And then we see then from uh, James quoting from uh, in Acts chapter 15, he's quoting from Amos chapter 9, saying that in the last days, Dave, God is in the business of rebuilding the tabernacle of David. It says, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Why? So that the rest of the mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Um, even now we read about uh, you know, houses of prayer all across the world that God is setting up. Uh, one of the houses of prayer I, I can think of is the International House of Prayer. Uh, it was it was founded by this person called Mike Bickle uh, in September 1999. September 1999, they started then, and it's still going on now for 24 hours, seven days a week through the year without stopping. From 1999 September till date, um, it's a house of prayer where worship, word, and intercession is being ministered. Like that, there are many houses of prayer across the globe that God is rebuilding. And those are the signs of where this verse is being fulfilled, where he's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Are you all with me? Yeah. How's the history lesson so far? Does anybody like history? Shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> History is important. It, it, it tells us where we come from, right? Uh, who we are, where we come from. It's very important. So if, um, all right. All right, let's move on. Okay. All right. Okay. So remember, we are learning about the prophetic word, uh, how to move prophetically in worship. So let's understand a little bit about what a prophetic word is. So what is the prophetic? If anybody asks you this question, what is prophetic? You just you can simply say this. The prophecy is simply God speaking to man through man. Yeah? Can we read that together? Ready? Go. Prophecy, God speaking to man through man. The Holy Spirit communicates the heart and mind of God to our spirit. Simple. Right? It's God speaking to man through man. Right? He speaks to me, and if I release the prophetic word, so he's spoken the word to me through me. That's what a prophetic word is. Right? And he can do the same thing with you, through you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Okay, do you believe that God speaks to us? Do you believe that He speaks to us? Right. So, why I'm asking that question is, you have to stop believing the lie that God only speaks to certain people. <clears throat> God only speaks to Pastor Ashish. He doesn't speak to me. He desires to speak to every single individual. You have to believe that. You have to believe that He speaks to you. Are you with me? Right? Um, again, I've heard people say, you know, I, I don't hear God. Uh, you know, I, I don't hear Him, but I can feel His presence. 
him being present is him saying something. Why? Because he is the word. Yes or no? He is the word. That means when he's present, he's saying something just by being present. So he's speaking all the, all the time. He is the word. That means he definitely has something to say. <laughs> right? Uh, so he speaks to us. So some of the ways in how he speaks to us, uh, how a prophetic word is released is through some of these points. So a prophetic word can come to you as an impression in your heart. I'll go through these points and I'll give certain examples, okay? A flash of information, quickening of scriptures, annoying on the inside, pictures, a word, sentence, paragraph, physical sensation, etc. So, and again, these are not the only points. Uh, there will be more ways in how he chooses to speak. But these are some of the points where he, um, it, where, through which God speaks most oftenly. Okay, so an impression, I want to connect the first point and the fourth point, that's an impression or the knowing on the inside. Uh, or actually everything is kind of interlinked to one another. Okay, an impression or a knowing on the inside is, uh, for example, um, so say God is impressing a certain scripture in my heart. Okay, that's one of the examples. So um, if I'm praying for you, I, as I'm praying for you, I might feel like he's impressing that he's restoring joy into your life. So I might hear the word, the Holy Spirit might put this word called joy. Right, he might impress, he might just whisper, or might just press, impress in your heart saying joy. So. And then as I'm praying, it's like, I feel like God's saying that he's restoring joy into your life. You release, you are obedient. You're taking... The... How do you spell faith? Spell faith for me. Spell faith. F-A-I-T-H. Wrong. You spell faith as R-I-S-K. Risk? Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yes. Um, you take that step of faith, is, is you take that risk. You're being obedient to his voice. Sometimes he'll say, okay, just release this word over that person. You, but you, you know, we'll be like, but I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. God did not ask you if it makes sense. God did not ask you if it's logical. But we create these questions in our minds. It's like, what if I say this? What if it's wrong? So what if it's wrong? It's not your word. <laughs> right? So you take that risk. All you have to do is be obedient. Say obedient. That's it. OK, so as you're praying, say I'm praying for Joseph. I'm, uh, Holy Spirit impresses this word called joy in my heart. And I just release, Father, in the name of Jesus, I release joy. I f uh, and I tell him, I feel like God is restoring joy into your life. So what's happening is I'm just being obedient to what God is impressing in my heart. And then to follow that up, he might also put a scripture in my heart. Right? Okay, so that's another thing, a flash of information. A flash of information, it's like, uh, like a word of knowledge. Uh, for example, let's say, okay, does anybody have a red car? I'm thinking of red card because I have a card. <laughs> okay. So a, a, a word of knowledge might come from uh, you know whoever is praying, saying, "Okay, I see that someone is having a red car, and that and uh, it needs to uh, go for service, and uh, God is releasing financial breakthrough." You see that? That is what's that? A flash of information, isn't it? Okay. Uh, a pictures is another way where he speaks to. Uh, has anybody has, has these experienced any of this, what I'm talking about? It's okay if you have not, because uh, nobody's going to jail. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but you've got to believe, right? You have to believe that God speaks to you, and he will choose to move through you prophetically. Are you with me? Okay, so uh, pictures, I remember this one time, uh, I was in Delhi, uh, for a worship conference, and uh, suddenly the worship leader turned back and he said, Roshan, I want you to play something prophetically. 
I'm like, uh, you know, I was taken aback, but my immediate response, I'm just using my example. Uh, so uh, I just said, Holy Spirit, I surrender. And at that moment, there was this image of uh, a sunrise. There was an image of sunrise. So I'm playing drums, but I'm seeing an image of sunrise. And so I had to come in agreement with my instrument and to what God was showing. And so, and then later, you know, if you don't understand this, then Holy Spirit will also interpret what you what that means. So he was saying, okay, the sunrise is a new day, a new beginning, a new start. So that's what God was releasing in that room at that time. And I was coming in agreement with my instrument on the drums. Are you with me? And so that way, he, again, he might choose to release pictures and speak to us through us as well. Word, sentence, paragraph, physical sensations, etc. Okay, so this, these are the few ways and how a prophetic word can be released, right? What's the time? Okay. All okay? All right. Um, so what does a prophetic word do? Why is it important? A prophetic word brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. The second point is very important. It's not self-serving. It does not tear down, but to call out destiny. Right? A prophetic word will always bring out edification, exhortation. It will always bring encouragement and comfort. It will convict, but it will not, it will not condemn. Okay? We have to understand the difference between conviction and condemnation. A prophetic word will always convict someone. So, again, when, when David sinned with Bathsheba, right, who comes to him? Prophet Nathan. Right? Prophet Nathan comes to David. And if it was condemning, condemnation will always point towards your identity. Conviction will always point to the action to what it was done. Good morning, bro. <laughs> Everything is falling in class today. I don't know what's happening. So. <laughs> okay. First Corinthians 14, 1 to 3, uh, verse 3 it says, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Okay, so the first thing, what does the prophetic word do? It brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. Okay, a prophetic word, second thing, it reveals God's plans and purposes. A prophetic word, it stirs up and causes up to move in faith. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So because of the prophetic words that's been released over you, spoken over you, use them to wage war, right? So prophetic word causes us to move in faith, a prophetic word provides motivation and strength to carry out God's purposes and plans. In prophetic words, it releases God's power on healing, deliverance, and breakthroughs. Finally, prophetic word, uh, sorry, not the final one. It brings correction and restoration. It's the example we just spoke about, about uh, Prophet Nathan and King David. Wait, look at that. It brings correction and restoration. And finally, prophetic word causes conviction and repentance. And it transforms nations. So what are all the eight things that a prophetic word does? Things, edification, exhortation. It reveals God's plans and purposes. It encourages us to move in faith. It gives us motivation and strength to carry out God's plans. It releases God's power brings correction and restoration, causes conviction and repentance, and transforms nation. Okay, these are all what a prophetic word can do. Yes? Now, 
everything what a prophetic word can do, the same thing will be done through a prophetic song. Okay? All the eight things what a prophetic word can do, the same thing can be done with a prophetic song. The same thing is released through a prophetic song. So prophetic song accomplishes all that the prophetic word does. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, what is a prophetic song? Now, there's one Hebrew word for worship or praise. That means to sing a spontaneous song to the Lord. What's that Hebrew word? Did I teach you that? Hmm. Let's throw some seven out of the seven. We'll throw one Hebrew word. Something must be right. What is Shabak? Ah, it's not spontaneous. What's the one Hebrew word? <coughs> Do you recall the name or the word called Tehillah? Ah, yes, sir. Tahila means to erupt in a spontaneous song. Right, a spontaneous song to the Lord, a song of thanksgiving, worship, adoration, and overflow of our hearts. A new song sung when God does a new thing in our lives. Psalm 33 verse 3 says, Sing to him a, a new song. Psalm 40 verse 3 says, He has put a new song in my mouth. Okay, uh, If you read that verse, Psalm 40 verse 3, it says, He has put a new song. It doesn't say, He may put, He might put, He will put. No, He has already put. Right? He has put a new song in someone else's mouth. Oh. <laughs> he's put a new song in my mouth. But if you complete that verse, it says, He's put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to my God. Why? So many will see and fear and put their trust in Him. That's the entire verse. The whole verse is not here. So he's put a new song in my mouth. So when I sing, when I release that prophetic song, many will see who this God is and they'll put their trust in him. Okay? So your prophetic song is connected with winning souls. Evangelism. Did you know that? Okay. Um, yeah, all, all of these points are there in your notes. I don't want to take too much time on those. A prophetic song uh, is a song of exhortation to the people. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, what does it say? Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Sing to one another with songs, psalms, and spiritual psalms. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? Let the word of Christ dwell. Okay, another word for dwelling is tabernacle, or it literally means pitch the tent. Okay, let the word of God dwell in you. Let it pitch, let it put one tent in your heart and stay there. And then sing to one another with songs, psalms, and spiritual psalms. A prophetic song is declarative in nature. So, how do we prepare? This is a classic question. Um, again, there's no any secret ingredient here in how to move in the prophetic. The first thing what you have to do is you have to believe that God will speak to you and God can speak through you, right? Once you believe that, the next thing is not uh, an uh, excuse. Uh, your relationship and walk with the, walk with the Lord. Intimacy is... Intimacy is key yes um, and I've sh I think I've shared this example before um, if a clo if our best friend or our father or a mother 
calls um you you will recognize their voice immediately isn't it yes um so if my father calls me on the phone i'm not going to say uh, who's this who's speaking i will immediately recognize my father's voice why because i have built a relationship with him and so when god speaks to you you begin to learn and memorize the way he speaks to you because the way he speaks to you will be very different from the way he speaks to me are you with me so you have to begin to learn to recognize the voice of god he might not always say behold dan where are you where art thou no he is not always going to do that in his bass voice and all of that right he might speak the way he wants to speak it's up to you to remember that and the next time when he speaks don't ask who's this who's this right you begin to recognize okay this is the lord this is the lord right so relationship with the lord intimacy is key and pray in the word of god um expectation is the point that i made you have to believe that god will speak to you you expect him to speak to you and you be sensitive to his leading okay um i'll just so i think i've shared uh, with you in how i approach my private time you don't have to do that so if you have if i have 1 hour i divide that into 20 minutes three times 20 minutes 20 minutes 20 minutes uh, you read the word you worship and you pray in tongues etc and yeah so those are all the simple practical tips on how you can develop to move in the prophetic okay so this is the last point that actually i'll stop sharing the screen because all these points are in your notes by the way so okay so why is this chapter important is not for us to say oh look at me i can move in the prophetic can you move in the prophetic it's not it's not for that we looked at those eight points on what a prophetic word can do isn't it yes or no so for that sake for his kingdom to be established here on earth as it is in heaven that's why it's important for us to release and move in the prophetic is to is us leaning into the heart of god and saying okay lord what do you want to do because in the gospel of john when you read the gospel time and time again jesus says this thing i do only what the father tells me to do i say only father i say what the father tells me to say i go where the father tells me to go jesus the son of god walked with absolute obedience he wanted to be led by his father are you with me you right and so you and me we have this incredible privilege that's an understatement we we have this incredible honor to take the key open the door of heaven and let the flood gates of heaven here on earth jesus has said i've given you the keys isn't it and so it's up to us we can't have the key and say okay what do i do with this keep it in your pockets there's no point and so for us to unleash heaven here on earth uh, we need to learn to move in the prophetic yeah all good okay yeah well i hope everybody online are still alive uh thanks for joining okay we've uh, exceeded the time by a minute okay god bless you thanks for joining i'll see you thursday thank you very much sir we are alive <laughs>